Welcome to the Pomerantz Mentor vignette series presented by ProScan and today we're going to cover the labrum and its innumerable variations and injuries but there'll be no MR images today. There'll be diagrams to give you a foundation for the viewing of complex MR cases that will come subsequent to this. So let's, let's begin right away. Let's look at the normal labrum first and we'll do a little drawing just to get you uh, comfortable. Um, in yellow we have here the labrum which I've depicted with this little blue mark. The labrum is attached to the underlying glenoid but with quite a bit of variation. When you get higher up in the shoulder there are more clefts and fissures between the labrum and the glenoid but only in the antero superior quadrant of the shoulder. Attached to the labrum with some variation is the capsule. The capsule then blends imperceptibly right here with the periosteum. Two other important structures that will come into play in our designation of injuries to the labrum are the hyaline cartilage depicted in blue seen on the glenoid but not to be confused with the humeral hyaline cartilage this is a joint so you're going to see cartilage on both sides and the underlying medullary cancellous or spongy bone. With all that being said you will diagnose abnormalities between the labrum and the hyaline cartilage at the base of the hyaline cartilage or this intersection. Abnormalities that go through the spongy or medullary bone. Abnormalities that go through or elevate the periosteum. Abnormalities that separate or strip the capsule from the underlying labrum. And abnormalities associated with a labroglenoid separation in which the labrum appears to float away with or without its attachment to the capsule. Let's take a look at our first abnormality, the classic Bankert lesion, often associated with a Hillsack's abnormality, which is an impaction injury that lies very close to the apex of the humeral head, but often a little bit off the apex to the side. The classic Bankert, which is a soft lesion, is associated with labroglenoid separation and breakage or fracture of the periosteum. In the classic Bankert, the bony elements are not involved. But be careful. If you take a piece or flake of cortical bone, you might not see it on an MRI, but only on a conventional radiograph. On the other hand, if you have a chronic macroinstability syndrome where the humeral head is constantly banging against the anterior bony glenoid, it may flatten or remodel it producing confusion and causing you to inappropriately diagnose a bony Bankert lesion which is the next one I want to discuss. In the bony Bankert lesion instead of the fracture running through the labrum or the labroglenoid interface and the periosteum it now runs through the bone. It may produce a hematoma elevating the periosteum or simply break right through it, which is the more common of the two bony Bankert variants. The next one I want to cover is the Perthes lesion. The Perthes lesion is virtually identical to the soft Bankert with one exception. The periosteal integrity is maintained. So even though the labrum is separated from the bone, often by a small amount, a little pouch forms in which hematoma and synovial fluid may accumulate, producing a small pseudocystic appearing lesion or wide cleft. But again, the periosteum is preserved. If this lesion occurs in the back of the shoulder, as it so often does in people that do bench pressing, military pressing, and contact athletes who constantly have the front of their arm struck anteriorly driving the humeral head backwards, they'll develop what's known as the reverse 
Perthes lesion or the posterior Perthes, also known as Kim's lesion. The next lesion I'd like to cover is the double lesion. Double referring to a two-pronged lesion. Not only is the labrum separated from the glenoid, but the labrum is now separated from the capsule. But the periosteum is maintained. And the capsule is not necessarily ruptured. Two abnormalities. Glenolabral separation and capsulolabral separation. This leads us to, naturally, the triple lesion. This time we have three abnormalities. Glenolabral separation, capsulolabral separation, and periosteal glenoid separation or elevation. Simple. The triple lesion. The next one's a little more complex. The anterior or antero-inferior labro-ligamentous periosteal sleeve avulsion. There, I said it. That's a mouthful. In this example, not only is the labrum separated from the glenoid, but it turns like you would turn the top of a can of anchovies, and it will roll medially and often inferiorly. When it's inferiorly displaced, it disappears in the axial view. You can only see it coronally. It rolls up underneath the elevated periosteal sleeve, which maintains its continuity, but is separated away from the underlying glenoid. The labrum has a great deal of variation into how far medial and how far inferiorly it will displace or roll with this labral injury variant. The next one I'd like to discuss is the glenolabral articular disruption, also known as the GLAD lesion. Some people refer to this as a partial rim tear or partial rim injury. The base of the hyaline cartilage is involved. The interface between the labrum and the hyaline cartilage is transgressed, and a linear partial rim tear involves the labrum but doesn't extend through it. The capsule is spared, the periosteum is spared, and a small hinge is created so that in various degrees of internal or external rotation, this component may wiggle out and, and wiggle in. It may wiggle out and may wiggle in, producing a flap-like phenomenon and catching or the sensation of functional micro-instability. In other words, in certain positions, the patient feels a click or a clunk or a snap. The next lesion, a related lesion, is the glenoid articulation rim divot or guard lesion, a focal predominantly hyaline cartilaginous divot that lies at the base of the fibrocartilaginous labrum but has little involvement of the labrum itself. This occurs at the base of the labrum but also may occur a little bit more posteriorly. Sometimes it's associated with a free body lying within the joint. The last lesion I want to cover today is the kissing cousin of the Alps lesion, but it's in the back. It's the posterior labroligamentous periosteal sleeve avulsion abnormality. The pulps lesion, as it's called, the opposite of the Alps lesion, has one major difference. There is little displacement or less displacement of the labrum posterior than anterior. This has to do with the fact that the capsule is often tighter anyway in the posterior aspect of the shoulder than the anterior aspect and more adherent. So it allows for less rotation, less migration, and less tumbling of the labrum into a posterior position. Let's call up our, our storyboard and draw for you what might happen to this fragment. Now, unlike a Perthes lesion or a reverse Kim's lesion, this lesion has a wider area of separation. There is posterior periosteal sleeve elevation as depicted right here, but it's often very little displaced. Occasionally, in a more violent injury, 
this posterior fragment will slide underneath like its counterpart, the Alpsa lesion, or rotate or tumble or turn, but this is less common. The reverse Kim's lesion or Perthes lesion has a very narrow area of separation and frequently has connection between the posterior labrum and the underlying glenoid so that the tear is only a partial tear in the back. We'll discuss this in greater detail when we get to our final section of labro-ligamentous injuries. So that summarizes our discussion in this vignette for today. We've covered a wide group, a wide swath of labro-ligamentous injuries. And the way I'd like you to think about it is in segments. You know, hyaline cartilage, fibrocartilage, capsule, and periosteum. And if you do nothing else but describe these individual components and what has happened to them or whether their integrity is preserved, you'll be fine. Thanks.